Okay, folks, we're going to go ahead and get started. I'm Marilyn Serafini. I'm with the Alliance for Health Reform. And on behalf of our co-chairman, or our honorary co-chairman, Senators Ben Cardin and Roy Blunt, I'd like to welcome you to today's briefing on trends in coverage and affordability in the ACA marketplaces. The fourth open enrollment period is just around the corner, November 1st, and our speakers today are going to help us to understand what the experiences have been and also what to expect moving forward. We're gonna hear about premiums, who has gained coverage, who remains uninsured, and why uninsured individuals have not obtained coverage. We're also going to talk about considerations of health plans regarding uh, marketplace participation. I'd like to thank our partner in this briefing, the Commonwealth Fund, and particularly uh, Rachel Newsom, who's also going to be my co-moderator today. Uh, before I turn the mic over to Rachel, I'd like to take a moment to say a few words about someone who's been a special part of the Alliance team for many years. If you've been to uh, some of our Alliance briefings uh, in the past, you have surely been greeted at some point by Dee Burton. Uh, Dee has been an employee of the Senate Food Service Program for over 33 years. Uh, I'm sad to report today that Dee passed away on June 14th. We will greatly miss Dee and we thank her for her many years of service and friendship. So to turn now to our briefing, uh, and again, before I turn the mic over to Rachel, uh, I'm going to go over just a couple of housekeeping matters. Uh, first, if you would like to join us on Twitter today, our hashtag is OE4, Open Enrollment 4. So we will be live tweeting. You can also ask questions via Twitter. We welcome your questions via Twitter. Uh, after our speakers give presentations today, we invite your questions. We can take your questions in several different ways. We have mics in the audience, and we can take your questions. You can stand up and ask your questions. We also have cards in your packets, green cards, and you are also welcome to write your cards on, uh, your questions on those cards, and our staff will be around to pick up your questions and bring them up to me and Rachel and we will present those questions to our panelists. Or again, you can uh, submit them via Twitter. Again, the hashtag is OE4. So with that, I will turn the mic over to Rachel, who will introduce the subject matter and our panelists. Great, thanks so much, Marilyn. Just wanna um, add my welcome and thanks on behalf of the Commonwealth Fund um, to you all for joining us today on a Friday afternoon. Um, you're so close to making it to recess, so hang on. It's in your, it's in your um, immediate future. Um, but we appreciate you taking the time out to really focus on a critical issue with us today. Um, and that's really, um, as Marilyn mentioned, focusing on um, what we know about um, how uh, coverage trends are looking, um, how beneficiaries are faring in terms of affordability when it comes to their plans um, in the new marketplaces, and then really importantly, um, how stable are these markets? Um, how um, are their plans available for folks and are the benefits there when they need them? Um, all of these questions will be addressed by our panelists. Um, and so um, you all have um, complete bios. We have a large panel today, so I just can give a few highlights, but I encourage you all to check out the full um, bios of our panelists. But we're gonna start with Sarah Collins from the Commonwealth Fund. She's Vice President for Healthcare Coverage and Access. Um, she leads all of our surveys um, and has authored numerous reports and analysis, policy briefs, issue briefs, and journal art articles focused on health insurance access, coverage, and affordability. Um, Sarah's gonna be followed by Corey Uccello, an actuary and a senior health fellow at the American Academy of Actuaries. Um, she serves as the um, chief public policy liaison on these health issues. And then my favorite thing about Corey is she's an actuary that actually speaks English that I can understand. So that's why we use her every July to bring this topic to you. Um, Corey is going to be followed by Kevin Lucia um, at the Georgetown University's Health Policy Institute, um, focusing on legal analysis of how states and the federal government regulate private health insurance. It's no small feat. Uh, with a focus on access, affordability, and adequacy of coverage, looking at state and federal laws, pending legislation, and current market practices, 
He's a grantee of the Commonwealth Fund, which is also incredibly important for you to know, um, and we're pleased to have him on the, um, on the panel today. And finally, we'll end with Justine Handelman, Vice President of Legislative and Regulatory Policy for Blue Cross Blue Shield Association, a national federation of 36 independent community-based and locally operated Blue Cross Blue Shield companies. Um, she oversees federal legislative regulatory policy development um, and works on a broad range of issues important to the um, Blue Cross Blue Shield companies, uh, Medicare, Medicaid, SCHIP, Federal Employee Health Benefit Program, you name it. So with that, um, thank you again for joining us and we're gonna start with Sarah Collins. Thank you, Rachel and Marilyn, and also thank you um, to, the, to the Alliance um, and the panelists um, for, for joining us today. Um, the last few years have brought um, significant change to the insurance coverage of Americans. There are 20 million fewer uninsured people than there were um, in 2010. Um, and this means that fewer people are exposed to the full cost of their health care, and we're seeing early evidence of this phenomenon in both federal and non-governmental data. CMS's estimates of U.S. health spending from late last year show a slowdown in the growth in consumer out-of-pocket costs and an actual decline in out-of-pocket spending on hospital care. Commonwealth Fund surveys and the National Health Interview Survey are finding nationwide declines in cost-related problems getting needed health care and also problems paying medical bills. The new Commonwealth Fund local scorecard, which we released um, this week, um, finds declines in cost-related problems getting needed care in 111 out of 306 local communities across the country. But future gains on these indicators are gonna depend critically on the affordability of both health insurance um, and health care. Um, to get a sense of what um, consumers are experiencing in marketplace plans this year with respect to affordability. I'm going to share some findings from the Commonwealth Fund Affordable Care Act tracking survey which interviewed working age adults about their health insurance coverage at the end of this year's open enrollment period. It is really clear, not only from our survey data, but from, all, from, from other um, analyses of marketplace plans, that marketplace enrollees are highly price sensitive. In the survey, cost was the most important factor in health plan selection among people who newly enrolled in 2016 and those who had switched plans in the most recent period. This price sensitivity has led to a very high rate of plan switching uh, during the last two open enrollment periods. Of those in the survey, about 46% of people who had had a plan since before 2016 said that they had switched, switched their health plans at least once since enrolling. Of those, 40% told us they did so to get a lower premium. The vast majority, more than 80% of marketplace enrollees have premium tax credits to help them pay their premium costs. We find that these premium tax credits have lowered premium costs for people with marketplace plans to levels that are comparable to those with employer-based plans among adults with low and moderate incomes. If you look at the second set of bars in the chart, 66% of marketplace enrollees with incomes under 250% of poverty told us they paid $125 a month or nothing for their single coverage plan. A similar share of people enrolled in employer plans reported paying that much. But if you look at the third set of bars, people with higher incomes paid more and they're paying more than people in employer-based plans are paying. This is because the amount of the tax credits phases out as income rises. In contrast, people in employer-based plans receive the same premium contribution, in most plans at least, regardless of, their, regardless of their income. We also find evidence in the survey that the tax credits are protecting many low and moderate income enrollees from premium increases. People's tax credits are equal to the difference between the share of income they're required to pay 
and the premium of the second lowest cost silver plan offered in their marketplace, or otherwise known as the benchmark plan. This means that most of a premium increase that someone might experience year to year is going to be absorbed by their tax credit, particularly if people stay in or switch into benchmark plans. Fewer than half of marketplace enrollees with incomes under 250% of poverty reported a premium increase over the time that they have had their plan compared to 64% of people who had higher incomes. About half of marketplace enrollees told us that their premiums are easy to afford. This is less than the share of people in employer-based plans who told us that their premiums were easy to afford. The difference widens with income. This reflects the phase out of the tax credits again, um, but also the fact that people in employer-based plans in our survey and just on average have much higher incomes than people on average in marketplace plans. The Affordable Care Act requires insurers in the marketplaces who sell plans in the marketplaces to offer silver level plans with what are known as cost sharing reductions for people with incomes under 250% of poverty. These reductions increase the cost protection of plans by lowering deductibles, lowering out of pocket limits, and lowering co pays. In our survey, there, the effect of these reductions is pretty clear. Among marketplace enrollees with incomes under 250% of poverty, 30% had deductibles of $1,000 or more compared to 68% of those who had higher incomes. New data released this week by HHS for 2016 healthcare.gov enrollees finds that 56% had deductibles, had individual deductibles of $1,000 or less. This likely reflects in part the fact that about 60% of people in market base, marketplace plans have, have these cost sharing reductions, um, have plans with cost sharing reductions. The flip side of this, of course, is that 44% of people enrolled in marketplace plans have deductibles that are $1,000 uh, or more. But it's important to remember, and if you look at the, the pie chart on the, on the left side, that many plans cover services prior to the deductible. So your plan, your a service doesn't, you don't have to meet your deductible before you get a service. By law, no one has to meet their deductible before receiving a pre preventive care service. But the HHS analysis also finds that 80% of 2016 enrollees have pre-deductible coverage for services beyond preventive care, including prescription drugs, primary care visits, specialist visits, mental health and substance use disorder care. Skip ahead. Just looking ahead um, the, uh, to the 2017 open enrollment period, which is, which is actually really close, um, analyses of preliminary rate increases by carriers suggest that, that premium increases will be higher in 2017 than they were in 2016. And the other panelists are going to talk about why, why we think that we, why we are likely to expect this. But most marketplace enrollees won't pay large increases in 2017. This is because insurer premium requests are subject to review by state regulators, and the majority of enrollees receive premium tax credits, which will absorb much of the increase that they'll see in their, in their rates, particularly if people remain in or switch to the benchmark plans. Given past experience, consumers will likely shop around for the best deal. But there are definitely cautionary notes in our survey findings. As income rises, enrollees pay higher premiums and they pay higher out-of-pocket costs. Affordability concerns are the most often cited reason uninsured people give for not pursuing coverage in the, through the marketplaces. The House versus Burwell case, which has challenged the way, the which, the way in which the administration is financing the cost-sharing reductions, put those reductions at risk. So policy adjustments are going to be needed to ensure the affordability for consumers going forward as well as the stability of the marketplaces. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Sarah. And thank you to the Commonwealth Fund and the Alliance for inviting me to participate today. I'll try to speak in English. I can't make any guarantees. So. <laughs> 
Um, so my role uh, this afternoon is to talk about the factors that are driving 2017 premium changes. Before I get to those factors, though, I want to back up and just talk about the components of premiums. So first is who is covered. What is the composition of the risk pool? Are the individual enrollees healthy, sick, young, or old, that kind of thing? And then given the composition of the risk pool, what are their projected medical costs? In addition to, to medical costs, other premium components include administrative costs, taxes, and profit. And then, of course, laws and regulations can affect each of these components. So in terms of the major drivers of 2017 premium changes, I'm going to highlight three factors. And first, first is medical trend, which is the underlying growth in medical spending. So medical trend is expected to rise slightly higher than it has in the past, but still remain low relative to historical levels. Um, there is still continuing concern, however, that prescription drug spending is outpacing that of other medical spending. On average, I think insurers are assuming medical trend of mid to, to high single digits for 2017. I'll next talk about the impact of the reinsurance program, but I want to provide an overview of all three of the ACA risk sharing programs. The first of these is the permanent risk adjustment program. And that program is used to transfer funds between insurers based on the relative risk of their enrollees. So plans that have a relatively healthy enrollee population are going to be paying into the program. Those insurers who have less healthy enrollees will be getting money from the program. The reinsurance program is a temporary program running from 2014 to 2016. And what that program does is reimburse insurers for a, a portion of the claims for their particularly high claim uh, enrollees. And the third program is the risk corridor program. Again, this is temporary running from 2014 to 2016. And that program was intended to mitigate the pricing risk that insurers face when there's uncertainty in terms of who is going to sign up for coverage and what their, what their spending would be. And that kind of program is particularly important during the first years of the ACA when there's so much more uncertainty. So next, just talking in particular about the, the reinsurance program, which again runs from 2014 to 2016, um, so it won't be in effect in 2017. So the reinsurance program declined over time. And so what the reinsurance program does is offset a portion of claims. And because a portion of claims are offset, that means that premiums are lower than they otherwise would be. As the funding for that program declined over time, the offset to claims declined over time, which means each year, 2015, 2016, and 2017, premiums are going to increase due to the reduction in that program. So 2017 will be the last year where there's that uptick in premiums because of the reduction in reinsurance. So for 2017, I think we're expecting an increase in premiums of 4 to 7 percent due to that final reduction in the reinsurance program. Here are just the, the program parameters of, of, of the reinsurance program. I'm not going to talk about it, but I'm happy to, to answer questions during the Q&A. And the third major driver I'll talk about um, has to do with changes in the risk pool composition and insurers' assumptions regarding the, the, uh, the risk pool. So as I mentioned, premiums reflect insurer expectations regarding who is enrolling in coverage and what their health spending is. Now, premium changes reflect changes in those underlying assumptions, including the expectations of how the risk pool profile may change from 2016 to 2017, and also how experience to date may have differed from the assumptions that were underlying their, their prior premiums. So I'll talk about both of these. So insurers this year had information when developing their premium rates for 2017. They had information regarding their 2014 and 2015 enrollee demographics and health spending. And then this was the first year that insurers also had information rego regarding the market-wide risk profile for the 2014 plan year. 
and that information included the results from the payments and receipts under those three risk sharing programs. And information from those uh, results uh, indicate a couple of things. First, the risk adjustment data suggests that some insurers may not have set uh, 20 or may have set 2014 premiums low relative to the market-wide risk. So insurers should be setting premiums that um, consider the transfers made under the risk adjustment program. So they should be kind of calibrating to market-wide risk. Um, second, the risk corridor uh, program data reveal that for many insurers, their 2014 premiums were too low relative to actual claims. And this is why you see, saw so many insurers expecting, um, after they saw their claims, expecting to get uh, payments from the risk corridor program. Now, 2017 premiums could increase to the extent that those results have not already been incorporated into the assumptions underlying the pre uh, prior premium changes. So, if to the extent that insurers already recognize, for example, there was the transition policy that took it, that went into effect after the 2014 premiums were finalized, um, that they may have incorporated some of that into their 2015 premiums but they may not have done so to the full extent they now think they, they may have to. I'm not sure that was English. So, so here's a chart from the Kaiser Family Foundation that shows the, the premium uh, changes for the second lowest uh, silver plan. And this just really shows across different cities uh, that just on average, the premium change requested for 2017 um, is higher than that that occurred in 2016. Um, and just a few more things that, that we need to consider as we're looking at the, the premium changes that have already been requested and have been released and those that will be finalized and released in the future. Um, first is that 2017 premiums in most states have not yet been finalized. Um, so that's something to keep in mind, as Sarah mentioned, that things may change when the, when the final premiums are released. Second, as we saw from the prior chart, premium changes can vary tremendously across states. In addition, premium changes uh, can vary tremendously within a state by insurer. And what we see in the news a lot when we, when we see things about premium increases, they're really just average numbers. And I would just caution that those averages may not apply to any particular consumer. Consumers can face different premium changes due to, to you know, with the particular plan they're in. They have aged a year, and so will face a, an increase in premium just due to that. They may have moved. They may have changed their family status, and their subsidy eligibility may have changed. So all those kinds of things can affect a particular person's premium change. And finally, consumers can potentially find a lower premium plan by shopping around. But again, I think it's important that people uh, look at not just the premiums of their plans, but also the cost sharing requirements and look at that together when choosing a plan. So here are just some um, papers that go into more detail from the Academy on this, but now I will pass it over to Kevin. Great, thank you. Uh, thanks for having me and I really appreciate being on this uh, panel. Um, so today I just want to talk a little bit about insurer participation in the marketplaces, the level of plan participation and looking at last year and some caution about making any conclusions for this year. Um, I also want to talk a little bit about some observations that we've seen at, um, in some recent research that we've um, completed looking beyond United Healthcare and the dramatic um, exit that they have taken and we've heard about um, continuously in the news over the last couple of months. And then some federal considerations and, and ongoing concerns of, of issues that probably do need to be addressed and are somewhat being addressed by the feds. So in 2016, and uh, just so you know, at Georgetown we try to study how many plans, we really stay focused on the state-based marketplaces and we try to really understand what's happening um, at, at the level of, of plans participating and why they're, why they're staying in and why they might be leaving. So in 2016, issuer participation in the marketplace re, um, remained very stable from 2015. From 2015. Um, nine of the SBMs experienced no change in issuers 
three saw a net gain. I think one of those was a new entrance to the marketplace, and five realized a slight decline. Um, HHS reported a similar trend in the FFM, and, um, and yet at the same time last year, the news cycle was basically saying the world was falling apart and influenza was leaving the marketplace um, in mass. So moving into 2017, I think it's important, you know, premiums haven't been uh, finalized yet, so we're still, you know, learning about what plans will not, um, definitely participate. And despite, you know, announcements, early, early announcements by United, um, the failure of um, a number of co-ops, um, we really need to kind of find out exactly what plans are staying in um, and, and, and be looking at, you know, new entrants, um, the plans that are maintaining um, in these marketplaces, are they expanding their service areas? You know, what's the local competition like? Do you need six issuers or, or can you tolerate, you know, four? So maybe a departure of one isn't so bad. Um, and then I, I also just wanna, you know, remind the room, I think we've talked about this in other panels, that a, a number of the SBMs have actually used um, issuer participation rules as a lever for driving competition. Uh, for example, in Maryland, if you play on the outside market and you sell individual health insurance policies, you have to play in the marketplace. And so they've been able to maintain a very robust number of um, issuers in, in, the, in the Maryland exchange over the last three years and will continue going into 2017. So, so United comes out a couple of months ago and, and, and really, um, you know, makes this dramatic departure from the marketplace. Um, it, it's important just to note that they were slow coming into the marketplace and then they expanded very rapidly into 2015. Um, there's, there's research out from Urban that shows, Urban Institute that shows that when they did play, they didn't always play, um, play hard. They weren't necessarily um, com competing um, I I aggressively on rates. Um, and, and overall, United really did maintain um, a modest share of the marketplace enrollment when you look at it across the nation. So just kind of got to remind ourselves of that. So what, what we thought we would do um, is, is look at the, the largest publicly traded issuers that were participating in the marketplace. And we, we basically reviewed their first quarter earnings calls um, to find out what they were saying about the marketplace. And we realized that there's a lot of perspectives out there um, that go well beyond um, United's experience. So what, what did they tell us? Um, so insurers are not withdrawing in mass from the marketplace. Um, uh, the, there, there appears to be a long-term commitment to the marketplaces on some of these larger for-profit companies. For example, Anthem noted that they're gonna continue participating in 14 markets and, and suggested that they were looking for expansion opportunities. Um, Marketplace enrollment remains stable um, for these large, large plans. In fact, some of them were seeing dramatic increases in their enrollment levels. So in Aetna reported enrollment above expectation with a gain of 200,000 people. Molina, which um, had been a former Medicaid-only plan, um, was seeing, uh, realized a, a, an increase in 420,000 um, new members um, fr from last year. So these are dramatic increases. Um, what we also heard was the risk pools continue to uh, evolve, but unlike United, some of these other carriers are, are having um, a better experience with their risk pool. Um, for example, Molina commented that its marketplace enrollees have been comparatively healthy, um, and that may be because they're targeting um, enrollees that had either been prior uninsured or just coming off of, of Medicaid. Um, and then, and then an, another major observation was insurers continue to, re, to view the marketplace as offering them a unique business opportunity. So the, these, these larger for-profit companies weren't necessarily ready to bail on the marketplace. Um, okay. They did um, point out a number of ongoing concerns, um, uh, complaints about the risk adjustment program, um, ongoing concerns about special enrollment periods, people kind of coming in between open enrollment periods and, and, um, and being high risk and high cost. Um, but I, I do want to point out in, in, in recent months, it, it seems like the federal regulators are listening to the issuer concerns. Um, they're offering changes to the special enrollment period rules. They're restricting the sale of short-term durational policies, which may have been pulling away some healthy risk from the marketplaces. 
and, and there's an ongoing discussion about risk adjustment um, and the risk adjustment methodology. So looking forward, I think it's important, especially when we think about United and if there's any other large carriers that you know, pull out of some markets, that, that it's important to understand that there's, a, there's many plans playing in these marketplaces. They come from all different directions. Um, and the Medicaid, the form of Medicaid only plans like Molina and Centene are actually having a much different experience than um, y you know, y United and some of the other larger players. Um, not all issuers will thrive in this uh, new and developing market. I think that's really important to understand. We came from um, an under, before the Affordable Care Act, we had an underwritten market and companies made money basically discriminating against people. And so, you know, we have new rules in place and it's gonna be a tough environment to succeed in and, and it's gonna require, you know, effective risk management and, and prohibiting discriminatory practices and I think we're, we're gonna have some issuers fail because they can't compete in that environment. Um, and, and I think that's okay. And then finally, I think there's a real important role right now for federal and state policymakers to be looking for opportunities to kind of resolve some of these ongoing problems that we're hearing from our carriers. I think we'll hear some from, um, from Justine in a bit. Um, and, and, and this is the moment. We're at the start of a marathon. We're only, what, four years into the Affordable Care Act and, and uh, many years to come, I hope. And, and over that time, we'll, we'll be working towards improving some of these, um, some of these underlying problems. So before we turn to uh, Justine, our final speaker, I want to remind you that if you are uh, following us, if you would like to participate in Twitter, the hashtag is OE4, Open Enrollment 4. And also that after we hear from Justine, we're going to open up the Q&A portion of our briefing, so be getting your questions ready. And again, you'll be able to ask your questions uh, via Twitter, uh, again, hashtag OE4. Uh, live at the microphones and also that you have uh, green cards in your folders that you can write your questions on so you can be uh, starting now even if you like. So uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Justine. Great. Thank you, Marilyn, and thank you, Rachel, for having me here today. Um, I really enjoyed sitting with the panel here and they've said many important things and hopefully will make my job a little bit easier. Um, just quickly before starting, I want to talk a little bit about Blue Cross Blue Shield. We've been in existence for over 80 years, and Blue Cross Blue Shield plans serve every market, the individual, the small group, the large group. We're in every zip code across the United States. We also are in government programs, Medicare, Medicare Advantage Part D, the Federal Employees Health Benefit Program. And the plans are extremely committed to the communities in which they serve and the customers they serve given their long history. My focus today is going to be on the experience of the marketplaces and then offering some recommendations of where we need to head. And I think a lot of uh, good groundwork's been laid by the other panelists, so I thank them. I think as Corey mentioned, we now have two years of real data of what is happening in the marketplace, who are the people that we're enrolling. And the data is based upon their actual medical claims experience. And we're beginning to understand the way these new enrollees are utilizing care, the care they need, the prescriptions they need, and what that means. And let me just share a little bit, as I talk about it, how that impacts premiums. And I think Corey did a really nice job um, showing how premiums are set. The newly covered have higher incidence of chronic conditions, hypertension, um, <laughs> diabetes, et cetera. And they're using more medical services. Now, that's not surprising, as was mentioned before and Kevin mentioned before the ACA, health plans could deny people coverage if they had a pre-existing condition, or they could rate people that were sick higher, and the rules today do not allow that to happen. Okay, here we go. But what did surprise us when we looked at the new enrollees, because going into this marketplace, when we didn't have data about who was in there, plans felt that this marketplace would look similar to the group market, because in the group market, um, it is a guarantee issue market, especially as you look at the small groups. So we expected costs to be similar to what was there. But what surprised us as we looked at the data and did a study is that the costs of those that came into the ACA marketplace in 2014 were 19% higher than those with employer coverage. And in 2015, 22% higher. So we saw that going up. So we didn't expect that to be that much higher. 
And I think Corey also mentioned, you do see a continued increase in medical trend, and that adds to premiums as well. The premiums, you have to have enough cost to cover your claims, so the makeup of the pool. But in addition, what is the trend? And certainly we've seen in the last um, few years significant increases in prescription drugs, generic drugs, as well as specialty drugs um, that has been adding to the costs. I think as we all know, a key to affordability is making sure that everyone is in the marketplace. When you have rules that you cannot vary premiums based on health status, you have to accept everyone regardless of health condition, you need everyone in. You need enough young, healthy people to balance out those that may be older or sicker with conditions. Um, incredibly important. And we are concerned the existing rules today don't do enough to ensure that everyone gets enrolled and that they stay continuously covered. What's really important for health plans, and we have many innovations underway, and I'll talk about that, is when people do have conditions, you want to help manage those conditions and make sure they get the care they need to keep them healthy, to keep them out of the hospital, um, to make sure that they're doing the things they need to do to stay well. But when people can jump in and out of the marketplace, it not only causes premiums to go up, um, but it also causes things to people to not get the ongoing care they need. Of particular concern to us, and I think probably for many in the room who have been talking to us over the year, you won't be surprised, um, we've had significant concerns over special enrollment periods. And the intent of the law, I think, as everyone knows, to make it work, everyone has to be covered. There is a mandate to drive that, but there's also an annual open enrollment period, and it's important that people come in during that period. But what we've been seeing is that the special enrollment periods have been misused, where people are using them to come in when they need care, and then even dropping coverage, so not even staying in for the full period once they get the care they need. And when you, kind of an analogy to think about it, you can't get your car insurance after you crash the car. Imagine if all of us could, how expensive our car insurance premiums are. The same is with health insurance. To keep it affordable, you need everyone in. When something happens, of course, if you have a balanced risk pool, you can spread the costs. We did a study I'm just going to touch on on the SEPs that does show how significantly they've been impacting um, because people are able to come in. Um, and we in AHIP worked with Oliver Wyman who collected claims data to see what was happening. And when you look at a per member per month basis, claims costs for those that were coming in through special enrollment periods were 47% higher in the first month of coverage in 2014 and 57% higher in 2015 for those coming in through an SEP compared to the open enrollment period. And then when you look at the first three months of coverage, again, those coming in through SEPs had much higher costs than those coming in through open enrollment. 24% in 2014, it went up to 41%. We did not have data for the full year in 2015, but looking to 2014, we know the impact of all of those people coming in through special enrollment periods. Um, their costs, those coming in through special enrollments, were 10% higher than those coming in through the annual open enrollment period. And we know special enrollments have been driving the enrollment numbers. In fact, in 2014 and 2015, nearly 20% 20 of the overall enrollment in the total exchange population came through special enrollment periods. Now, I don't want anyone to walk away and think that special enrollment periods are not important. They are incredibly important. If someone has a life change, they move and they've had insurance and they need to get insurance in their new state, they've had a baby and they need to add the baby to their policy, they've had employer coverage and they've lost that coverage, absolutely, you need to make sure that that special enrollment period serves them. But what we believe needs to happen is that just like we do off the exchange or you see in Medicare Advantage, if someone has one of those changes that requires them to come in through a special enrollment, that they prove that they should be coming in. Kevin um, alluded that recently the administration did do some action to help, and they did take a first step. Um, we don't think it's a step that goes far enough, but it's a first step. They changed the rule to require that if you move, you need to show that you had prior coverage in order to get in through a special enrollment period. So before that rule, you could be uninsured, you could move, and then you could get insurance. So think back to my car insurance um, analogy. So they've said you have to now for a move. That's the only one of the special enrollments you have to prove prior coverage. But where we don't think the administration has gone far enough is requiring upfront eligibility, um, making sure that people are eligible before you enroll. Right now it's presumptive eligibility, so we will be looking um, 
back in a, about a 60-day period to see if they were eligible. They'll be enrolled, as you saw those numbers. They can come in and get services. And then if they weren't eligible, you know, CMS will then say, well, then you can terminate. And we're concerned about that. I'll quickly um, go through a couple of things because I know I'm, I'm running out of time. But there are some other factors that we have been concerned about um, that have led to the increased premiums. Um, certainly, we believe the difficult launch of healthcare.gov um, many of the young, healthy people that might have otherwise come in did not come in, and it's harder to get them. Again, we're seeing the makeup of the pool. Corey mentioned the transitional policies. We had set our premiums expecting to migrate many people over. When in November, um, the, a rule was put out to say, if you like what you have, you can keep what you have. Many plans scrambled to allow that, but we didn't price our premiums knowing that would happen. That had a huge impact, and Milliman just put out a study that actually shows there are grace periods where if someone stops paying their premium, they can't be terminated for three months. So the first month, they can still continue to get coverage. We have to pay for it, and then claims are pended. We know that McKinsey's put a study out to show that people are actually doing that and then re-enrolling, so we've seen an uptick there. So there's been a number of, of factors that have let, left us to be concerned. And I know Corey spoke about the uh, reinsurance program that is uh, expiring. There's been con some confusion, and we can talk a little later if folks want. There's an early retiree reinsurance program that needs to refund Treasury, the temporary. It's all private funds. But just moving real quick, if I can, what are we doing? We are working very hard to keep people healthy. Most health plans, and I won't go into it, but as um, Sarah mentioned, are providing coverage outside of the deductibles to make sure people get the care they need. There are many ways that people can get primary care, specialty care, prescription drugs before meeting the deductible, and we're trying to incentivize them through patient-centered medical homes. But going forward, what do we need to make sure that this is a viable market? I think what's really important is that government needs to be a good business partner. When Medicare was enacted, certainly um, Medicare Advantage and Part D, there were changes over time that were needed to stabilize. We can't go back and change the rules after they've been set and we've established premiums and contracts to provide services. And there have been a number of areas, transitional policies I've mentioned, the risk quarters were mentioned, where the rules were changed after the premiums had been set that had an impact. So we really need the government to be a good, a good business partner. The premiums need to cover the cost of providing medical care. Health plans have no incentive to set premiums higher than what they need to cover because we live under medical loss ratios. If it's too high, we rebate. Health plans need to get the, the premiums to cover those in their population. The marketplace um, rules need to promote continuous coverage. I've talked about some of those. And then health plans need to have the flexibility to innovate and make changes as they go forward. Having rigid rules and having to do things in a very cookie cutter way can make it difficult to provide the benefits that best need, meet the needs of the consumers and the population we're serving. So as we look to the future, um, I just want to mentioned that we now have the data to inform um, what the marketplace looks like and uh, we have ideas on how we can continue together to work for a strong, stable, affordable private marketplace. Great. Thank you to all of our speakers and now we are ready to hear your questions and while you are gathering your thoughts, uh, we're going to turn to Rachel to kick off the first question. Great. Thanks, Marilyn. Um, and thank you to all of our panelists. Um, Justine, you kind of opened the door to special enrollment plans, so let's just go through it. I would love to hear, because we've heard a lot about this in the press, we've heard a lot about it, obviously, from plans. Um, they're obviously designed to fulfill a very specific need for beneficiaries, but um, Sarah and others, um, is is Blue Cross Blue Shield, you know, experience common? Are we seeing these trends across the country? What do we know about the folks that are kind of coming in nationwide through the special enrollment plans um, and, you know, are there steps that we should consider um, taking to kind of address some of the things that Justine laid out? So just a, just a couple couple points, and Justine obviously has, has the data to really look at, at who is coming in in special enrollment periods. Um, but it's important to really think about why, why we have these. Um, most people in the United States have employer-based coverage and a major source of uninsurance um, prior to the Affordable Care Act was people losing their employer-based plans and, and not having a place to go. So these, these special enrollment periods were particularly designed 
for that problem. When people lose coverage because they lose their job, because their, their spouse um, dies, um, divorce, et cetera, um, having a place to go. Some analysis that the Urban Institute has done found that only 15% of uninsured people who would qualify for a special enrollment period um, are actually using them. So there's really an underutilization of, of people um, um, of those special enrollment periods. Um, the, other, the other thing I just want to make sure that I'm clear on, um, I understand the fixes by the administration included requiring documentation for the most common um, special enrollment periods. So I think it's more than moving. I think you have to fill out a set of, um, of documents um, verifying that you actually experienced a job loss or, 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 or qualifying um, for a special enrollment period. So it's a little bit more extensive than, um, than just, um, just, just moving, um, I think. Um, the other thing that the administration changed um, is in the risk adjustment program, they're allowing for adjustment for partial year enrollment. And so I think that, and Justine can, 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 can address that too, but I think that also addresses carriers' concerns about higher than expected um, um, costs from, as a result of the special enrollment periods. And a lot of that is newborn children. So babies are by definition expensive, and so when you cover them, they're just, it's just gonna, it's just gonna um, um, show up. But I, I think we have to really be concerned about tightening down on these special enrollment periods. Um, it might actually backfire. Um, we might actually end up um, tightening them down to such an extent that only the most motivated people, the most highest risk people, actually try to try to try to come in, and people who are healthy uh, may stay out of the pool, stay uninsured until they can pick up um, coverage, coverage someplace else. So just just a few thoughts on that. If I could just make one comment, um, Sarah is right. The administration will require documentation for those coming in. However, our concern with the requirement is the documentation is after the fact that you've been enrolled. So you can't hold up an enroll a special enrollment until you get the documentation. The consumer will have, I believe, up to 60 days to provide it so they could come in, get all of the coverage they need, and then drop. So our, our recommendation is that that documentation should be submitted before you are allowed in. And one thing to the point, special enrollments, absolutely they're important, but I think we need to really educate and drive people in during the annual open enrollment period so as many people come in and therefore don't have a need to wait. If someone has lost their employer coverage, um, absolutely they qualify for a special enrollment. But I think we need to do more to get people in during the annual open enrollment so that there isn't the misuse and certainly from our point of view, require that documentation before you are enrolled. Okay, we have a question at the mic. Could you please identify yourself? Sure. Hi, my name is Heather Foster. I'm the Vice President of Marketplace Policy at the Association for Community Affiliated Plans. And we represent a lot of the um, safety net health plans, Medicaid focused historically, and many of them have moved into the marketplace. It's been a relatively new space for them. Um, and I guess my, I have two questions. I'll start with the first one, which um, is for Sarah and Kevin predominantly. And in the in Commonwealth's uh, most recent brief that you put out, I know you stated that um, just under half of all of the respondents said that they found their co coverage affordable, and also that cost was the most important um, factor as individuals pick out their plans. And we've actually seen some other data from NORC and Commonwealth Fund that shows that the Medicaid plans tend to offer the lowest premiums, and at least on average, sort of looking nationwide, and I think that's largely um, because of their experience with care management, a lot of this low-income population, vulnerable populations. Um, and we've also seen from some of our own analyses that we did, looking at QHPs in the marketplace, that about 40% of all QHP products, um, the issuer also offers Medicaid coverage. They're in both lines of business. And wondering um, if you could both speak a little bit to the role of these types of plans with some of the Medicaid experience, and if you've done any research looking into either consumer satisfaction by plan type or at all breaking out the different plan types and what the impact of that is on the market. Okay. Um, you, you know, actually, we, we are um, at Georgetown, we'll be starting with Commonwealth funding to look a little bit more at um, the form of Medicaid-only plans that are participating in the marketplace. And I, I think as um, there is research out from Urban that shows that 
when, when they do enter a market, um, they're, they, they end up being very aggressive on pricing and, and successful in, in pulling in share. Case in point, in Rhode Island, uh, Neighborhood Health Plan came into the Rhode Island market, which had been dominated by Blue Cross Blue Shield, and I, I think they have over 50% of the market. Now, now, one question that I think all of us have to ask is, is it sustainable, right? Um, I think sometimes the, the, the it, probably very often, um, th they're coming into the market riding off of um, uh, reimbursement rates that are lower than your commercial um, plans. And so will, will, the, will they be able to maintain those reimbursement, reimbursement rates which drive premiums um, as they go into the future? And, and just on the, um, the affordability, the affordability issue, perception, percep people's perceptions of the affordability of their health plans. So we are seeing fewer, about half of people um, with marketplace plans viewing their premiums as somewhat or very easy to afford. It's lower than, than what people are tell us in employer, employer based plans. So even when you, when you look at what people are actually pay paying in marketplace plans, even though they're similar to what people are paying in employer based plans, at least for lower income, there is this divergence in the perception of the affordability um, of those plans. We're also, um, we also see um, among people who are uninsured now, so we have a good sample of people who are without health insurance coverage, and we ask why they haven't come into the marketplaces. And the primary reason is, is the, thinking that they, if they haven't visited the marketplaces, they're concerned that they won't be able to afford the coverage. If they've tried to enroll, also cite affordability as the primary reason why they didn't sign up. And the majority of people um, who are telling us this are actually in the range that makes them, income range that makes them eligible for tax credits um, and, and the subsidies. So I think there is, um, per, per, there is perception um, among a large number of people that who are in the marketplace plans, have them already, and also are, are thinking about coming in, that it's just, just not affordable for them. So I think that really is an important thing to think about in as, as policy, think in terms of policy changes, education, but also making sure that these tax credits are in fact making plans affordable for people. Great, and if, can I ask my follow-up question? Um, sure. Which is actually for Corey, and um, you mentioned, you made the point that issuers need to calibrate for um, the market in terms of risk adjustment, and you need to calibrate for what the whole risk is throughout the market, but um, I have noticed, at least looking through the 2015 um, reinsurance uh, and risk adjustment report that just came out, that um, many of these smaller, is smaller issuers and Medicaid-focused issuers have ended up um, being on the hook for millions of dollars, and they otherwise would have been able to keep their costs down. And so I'm worried that perhaps um, once you start looking at that whole market-wide risk, you actually, it might end up artificially driving some of those premiums up, particularly for those Medicaid plans that have been historically able to keep costs down. Um, so I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about the, that potential impact on enrollees, um, as well as the stability for the marketplace. So let me first back up and just kind of talk about the, the rationale behind having the risk adjustment program. So it's there again, it transfers money across insurers based on their relative risk. And it's, it's there to, to help reduce any incentives that insurers would have to, to cream skin, to just pick the healthy risks. So premiums then in general need to incorporate in them any transfers they're going to pay or receive. So yes, if, if you've got a healthier population, your premium is actually going to be higher than what that population would indicate because you're making a transfer um, to, to the other plan. So I think that's part of, of what's going on here. Yeah, and I think, I guess my, what I'm um, trying to touch on is that that may well be the case, but for plans um, that have ha that have that ability to otherwise keep costs down, such as the Medicaid plans that have come in with lower premiums and have been able to um, offer lower premiums because they have either those lower reimbursement rates or more experience with care management, that ultimately you are um, just dri artificially then, in order to respond to that risk, driving those premiums up higher um, than they otherwise 
might be. Um, and so you sort of artificially drive the whole market up rather than keeping some of those premiums low. And I'll just, I'll refer people to our issue brief that, that was noted on our last slide that we've looked at the risk adjustment program. And one of the, the approaches that's been forwarded is, well, can you make the transfers based on the, the plan's actual premium instead of the statewide premium? On one hand, it sounds like it makes sense because it would incorporate those different if you can do better care management and just have lower costs. But there are some downsides to that in that it could, um, create some, some not great incentives in terms of setting the premium. So I think it's, it's um, kind of a complex issue, and it's, but it's, I, we outline it in our paper in more detail. Okay, let's turn to this side for a question. Yeah, um, <coughs> Carl Polzer, a health policy analyst. So this question is about the special enrollment period, and it stems from an experience I had in February trying to help somebody get on the exchange. And it, it has to do with, I think, if, the, the concern that if you tighten them up, for some people, it may cause an issue. Um, yes, there's a legitimate free rider problem. If you have no insurance, and then you just go, go to get insurance when you get sick, hence the special enrollment period. But what if you already have insurance? This is a case where a woman, um, husband died of cancer. She became impoverished. She had expenses of $18,000, <coughs> or income of 18000 all of a sudden, and about $25,000 of expenses every, every year. So we try to get on the exchange, and basically they said, well, there's a lot of sensitivity. You're never going to do it. This is uh, just because you just missed the open enrollment period. It turned out she got on because the, the, the staff on the exchange, I went to the policy people, and they said, no way, but the staff on the exchange agreed to it. But here you have a case where she, she had no major health issue. It's just an economic change in economic status, needed the government's money, and I don't know what's, what's, what would be harmful to the industry. I mean, for people that have insurance already, why even have an enro I mean, you, you, even if it took underwriting, why even have an open season? They're already, all they need is the subsidy. You see what I'm saying? They're not coming from no insurance to insurance. Well, I think special enrollment's the way they're supposed to work in that situation, so I don't know the circumstances. Sounds like worked as it shouldn't have. If someone had prior coverage and loses that coverage, they should absolutely be able to come in through a special enrollment period. Yeah, but it was, uh, everybody I talked to in authority said it wouldn't happen. It was just the ladies on the exchange that made it happen. The, on the phone, they'd get a different one every time. We, d we do have a question. Um, there's obviously been a lot of news lately about um, the co-ops. Um, obviously, Illinois was the, the latest one that we've been hearing about. So there's a question from the audience about um, co-ops, kind of what's not working with those. Um, and then sets up a, a, a broader question about um, how can we, what do we know about the plans that are going to be successful on the marketplaces? Justin, you touched on a little bit about this. Um, and you know, so what do we know about plans that will be able to be successful, and what does this mean for new market um, entrants? So maybe if everyone can just take it quickly. Can I touch on co-ops? Yeah, Carl? Um, sure. Um, so yes, um, a significant number of the co-ops have failed. Um, I think um, it's really it's a, an incredibly difficult environment to become a new entrance in, and um, these. These co-ops started from scratch with um, very little funding. They had a number of barriers that was kind of inherent into the program that they were set up on, and and um, I, I think I think w w you know one thing led to another, and, and and here we are, you know, four years later, and 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 over I think it's over half the co-ops. I think there's nine standing um, from the 22 that 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 began. Um, so, um, but speaking of. Uh, it, how, how to bring more competition in, into the marketplace. Um, I do think that, y you know, when you look at the scope of plans that are out there that hadn't been into to the individual market prior to the ACA, um, you are, as we talked about before, seeing success in, in some of these former um, Medicaid-only plans. And um, although a number have entered, there are many states out there that, um, that, that these plans um, still just participate in the Medicaid market. And so we, we probably do need to learn a lot more about 
um, how, how to encourage those plans to come in, what the barriers are for them coming in, what, what are the um, successful features of, of the plans like um, Molina and Centene, what are they doing right that's allowing them to have a, a successful run so far in, 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 in the commercial market. And I could touch on, if you want, the, the second half of what you need to do. Kevin just talked about um, the Medicaid managed care plans, and I know CMS had a best practices conference and, and some of the Medicaid managed care plans were there. I think when you look at it, on those plans, they, have, they pay lower rates to providers. They pay Medicaid rates, and many of the commercial plans do pay a higher rate. So the messages CMS has put out is you've got to negotiate tougher and lower the rates to providers. Tighter utilization, there's a lot more prior off um, and uh, utilization management that may happen on that end. Um, certainly, we believe we want to see robust private innovation continue, and it really pushes of how do you make sure you've got continuous coverage. There are some gaming around third-party payments where you've got uh, certain groups that may be paying the premiums for sick people. We're even seeing instances of people being shifted from Medicaid or Medicare to ACA plans because they get a higher reimbursement. Um, that has caused some issues. The health insurance tax is another thing that just adds uh, percentages. You know, it, it was uh, the moratorium for a year, which we were pleased to see, but when that comes back in, in 2018, that'll add more than 3% to premiums. So I think we need to look at what are the things that are going to drive innovation and affordability. Just a, just, a, uh, just a couple additional points on the co-ops. I think, I think it's really important, too, to look at, as Kevin says, to look at these as a special case. Um, there were definitely um, provisions in the law that, that, that made it more difficult, even as new entrants, for them to come into the marketplaces, and then their funding was cut dramatically um, after um, subsequent to implementation, which also affected it. And the risk order program was so important for new, for new entrants, um, including the co-ops, and not and having the expectation that they were going to get risk quarter payments and then not getting them was, was certainly devastating um, to, to many of them. So. Okay, question over here. Hi, thank you. Um, I'm, my name is Michael Fury. Um, I'm, I'm an intern. Um, I, was, I wanted to ask a little bit about the components of um, the premium, like growth or decline within like the difference between you know, the risk premium and like loading fees. Um, that occurred, you know, after um, the implementation of the ACA. I didn't know if there was any research um, that uh, discusses, you know, um, the, whether there's more growth in, like, a, a percentage growth in, like, the loading fee or if there's more percentage growth in, like, the risk premium where, you know, insurers have to account for changes within the risk, within the insurance pool, within that risk pool. stab at this, but <laughs> Justine. Um, I, I don't have a direct answer to your question, so I'll say that off the bat. But um, I think you know, the, the, the law has those medical loss ratio requirements. Mm -hmm. So the amount that a plan can spend on administrative costs, profit, fees, those kinds of things, um, that amount is limited by the law. Um, so I think that may have affected plans in terms of trying to get more efficient with, with, with the way they were working, but I, I haven't seen any particular studies that, that look at that. I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah. I'll just, um, just make a, yeah. a quick, quick, quick point on this. We have a, um, Como Fund published a piece by Mark Hall and Mike McHugh earlier this, this summer that looked at the performance of plans inside the marketplaces versus outside the marketplaces, so on the, on the individual market but not operating the exchanges. And they find, what they find is that the medical loss ratio performance of plans in, inside the marketplaces is actually better or more efficient than those that are operating exclusively outside the marketplaces. So there does seem to be a, a, a decrease of administrative costs um, in, in plans that are competing in the marketplaces relative to, out, to, out, to outside, um, reflecting really this dynamic of, of um, competition in the marketplaces. Gotcha, okay, thank you so much. Um, Great, thanks so much. Um, this uh, question is directed to Corey, but I would guess that all of you might have a quick response, and that is um, thinking about um, the role that um, drugs, drug spending, especially high-cost drugs, may potentially be having on premiums. Um, what do we know? Do we, do we know enough? And if not, um, maybe this is just setting up our October 7th briefing on prescription drug pricing policy, but um, in, until we get there, um, 
do we know, do you have a sense, Corey, of kind of the percentage or the impact that drug prices is having on premiums? I don't have off the top of my head what percent of, of claims are, are due to drugs. Um, it's smaller than medical claims, but I think it's growing because the costs have been, um, as I said, outpacing the medical claims themselves. I think in the recent years, um, we've seen the high cost specialty drugs really driving the increase in prescription drug spending. Um, but I think that the um, paper that came out just yesterday or a couple days ago from the CMS office of the actuary, I think they, did they expect that that prescription drug spending would kind of level off um, if I'm remembering correctly? I would just say quickly, I know, um, and we don't have the data, but we were looking to uh, do some study in this space that prescription drug spending has been an increasing amount of the premium dollar. It's not, by far, it's still in the low double digits, but it has been increasing. And the one thing I just point out that's difficult for health plans is there's a lot of transparency around health plan pricing and premiums and how we file our rates and all of the information that goes in. There is not a lot of transparency on how a drug price is set. And when a drug comes out mid-year, when you've already set your premiums and something, you may have a blockbuster drug. I know Savaldi was an amazing drug that had a cure, but it came out mid-year. We didn't know the price and we didn't know the indication how big the population was going to be. And when that comes out mid-year and your premiums are set, it can have a really big impact um, when you have something so costly for so many people. So greater transparency into when things are going through the FDA, what's the price and what's the indication so we can make sure we are collecting the premiums to cover those is really important. Great question. Uh, yes, my name is Language Farrell. I'm a clinical quality improvement analyst. And this question is really about special enrollment. Uh, has there some stratification been done on the reasons for special enrollment? Uh, I think especially if we're talking about people losing employment and then enrolling in the special enrollment period. And if that's the case or there's some specific uh, mechanisms in place to take into account that they may return to work and leave that plan and go back to another employer. weigh in as well, but, the, but, we, but we do know this is the most common special enrollment period. So it's just, just by the sheer numbers of people who have employer-based coverage and how much and how much how easy it is for people to lose employer-based employer -based plans. And we also know, just based on Urban Institute analyses, that a very, only very, they, that accounts for by far the largest share of people who are eligible for special enrollment periods, but it also accounts for the, they, the people, most people the vast majority of people who are eligible for special enrollment periods because they lose employer-based policy um, don't actually sign up for a, for a special enrollment period. So they stay uninsured either for either until the very end of the year or they stay uninsured for a few months and then pick up coverage through another, through another, um, through another employer. And I just add quickly, um, we've been asking CMS one thing that would be helpful to get exactly at what you were looking for is we don't often have the reason why someone's coming through when we get an SEP through the FFM. So we've asked for reason codes so we can understand where are they coming in and are we seeing you know, greater needs in one or, or different patterns in another. Um, so that's something we've been pushing them to do is let us know the reason so we can see what's happening and then see if there are policies to address. Hi, Paul Heldman, um, I'm a health policy analyst with Heldman Simpson Partners. Um, I know Justine touched on this, but I'm curious whether you have any additional suggestions or other members of the panel have done about what can be done via regulation or the administration acting without Congress to mitigate premium increases and to uh, get more healthy people to sign up for coverage in the marketplaces. And then also, um, is there any, are there any areas of potential bipartisanship agreement legislatively to address this issue? I'll take, I'll take a, I'll start off as uh, people are gathering their, their thoughts. I'm sure everybody has, has lots of thoughts. Um, I think just on, in terms of enrollment and increasing enrollment, this is, this is, there's clearly a large number of people who are eligible but not enrolled. Again, in our survey data, it is really, um, 
um, concerning that the majority of people who are uninsured um, have incomes that make them eligible for the tax credits or Medicaid. Um, so that, that's, that, that it indicates that we continue to need to have strong outreach um, and enrollment, enrollment efforts going ac across, um, across the country. Um, I think helping people understand, in, in, in addition, um, what these subsidies mean in terms of their um, reduction in their premiums. The media, obviously, um, when, when there is a lot of, because of all these, the rate increases um, that we're hearing, it does, it does lend um, the sense to people um, that, that the premiums are skyrocketing and they're just not going to be affordable um, for them. So I think education for consumers is going to be very important. I think we also need to look at this, the, this whether or not um, the premium tax credits are affordable across the income distribution for people. That the premium tax credits, as they are now structured, make health plans affordable across the income distribution. That cliff, that 400% of poverty, you're still looking at people who are earning about $90,000 for a family of four. Um, at $400,000 a year, they drop off and they face the full premium. And we know from our data that, uh, that, that people are probably crowded right, in, right close to that, to that, income, that income level. Um, and so do we, do we want to think about increasing the premium tax credits um, either higher up the income scale or even um, increasing um, the generosity of those? And I think the cost sharing um, is another area for, um, so for some really strategic thinking about how we can make um, out-of-pocket costs uh, more affordable for people. Just touch on real quick on the bipartisan side. The Energy and Commerce Committee actually has a few bipartisan bills um, that they were looking at that we thought we believe would be extremely helpful. One is on the SEPs um, to require more of the upfront verification, as we talked about. Um, on the grace periods, um, they were looking at either returning control to the states. States typically have a 30 day grace period before someone's terminated. So it's not three months that they can stay on, pay nine months of premium for 12 months of coverage. And then adjusting the age bands to five to one. And then I know um, the other issue that's at least talked about on both sides of the aisle is the family glitch to make sure um, you know that families are actually getting the appropriate um, subsidies that they need and addressing that. So there are some things, and I agree with Sarah as well, of if you could look at the subsidy and how it interplays with the age. Um, right now, an older person who makes more because of the, the way the age band works may actually get more of a subsidy than a younger person who makes less. So how you look at the right incentive for that. Yeah, we seem to be uh, hearing more about uh, from some folks about uh, changing the age band. And uh, we recently heard from the administration some uh, um, uh, about uh, their uh, efforts to uh, bring young invincibles uh, 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 into uh, uh, their efforts to get them to purchase insurance. I'm wondering if you, uh, if any of you can talk about their efforts because uh, Sarah, you mentioned in your remarks that of course that this is one area where uh, we haven't, uh, where we're still seeing a lot of uninsured, the young invincibles uh, not signing up. So how do we get these folks uh, insured? And um, uh, you know, so uh, Justine, since you mentioned the age band, um, Doug Holtz-Aiken mentioned uh, just very recently that by changing the age band that he believed that that would uh, lower premiums. So what would be the impact uh, of doing that? And how do we get the young people to sign up? So just just a couple comments on the age band on the age bands. Currently, it's three to one, so carriers can charge um, can charge older people three times um, what they charge younger people. This is one of the few places that carriers actually can adjust their rates um, based on um, based on the demographics of a of an enrollee. Um, we had some research um, or some research was done for us by um, Rand by Chrissy Eibner, looking at what it means to change from a three to one to a five to one band, and what they find is that. Um, the increase for older adults is much higher in terms of premiums than the decrease for younger adults, and it results in a loss of health insurance coverage of about 800,000 older, older adults um, and, at a, and at a significant cost to the federal budget of $9.3 billion. So this is a very expensive um, proposition for the federal government. It would lead to more uninsurance among older people and really not get much of a gain on coverage of young adults. Uh, I really think the issue for young adults is someplace else. 
If you look at the demographics um, of Marketplace and Rollies, about 30% of Marketplace and Rollies this year were, under, were, were between the ages of 19 and 34, so not that different from, from their overall representation in the population. They are overrepresented in the Medicaid expansion. So states that would expand their Medicaid programs um, would probably see a big surge in enrollment among young adults um, since they are um, uninsured young adults tend to have very low incomes, incomes in the range that make them eligible for, um, for Medicaid. Another policy that I just saw in the paper this morning, and I'm not saying whether it's good or bad, is the, the perhaps unintentional impact of allowing uh, children to stay on their um, parents' policies until age 26, that that removes them from the individual marketplace. Um, I'm not saying it's a great idea to, to not allow that anymore, but that's also impacting the risk profile of the market. Um, but just in, in general, I think, you know, greater outreach, other things to try to get uh, the more healthy of all ages to enroll in, in the program is important. It's not just a young issue. I think it's a healthy of all ages issue. I, I would just say, in, in, you know, back to outreach. I mean, when you look at a state like California, which has been successful at, um, at, at maintaining their numbers, expanding their numbers, they've been able to, because of their diverse and expanded risk pool, they've been able to um, maintain lower, lower premium increases. Um, and, but they put a lot into their outreach. I mean, if you're in California, there's, there's work being done on the ground. They have storefronts. There's a me massive media campaign. You know when it's open enrollment. And, um, and that, that's not necessarily true in, in all state-based marketplace states and, and certainly not in the FFM states. So I, I think like before you start tweaking with or, or massively changing um, some of these mar market rules, I think it's important to like do the groundwork that you have to to make sure that we're we're expanding enrollment during open enrollment periods. I think that's what you were saying. Too. Yes, no, absolutely. And the other thing I I mentioned is we've done quite a bit of research around millennials and what drives them and how do you get them in. And we know millennials don't value healthcare as much as maybe I do um, for my family or my parents may. Um, they want that on-demand care. So for them, seeing a primary care doctor might not be as important, you know, if the appointment's four days from now, than going into a retail clinic and getting what they need in the next hour. They want to be rewarded. If they feel they're eating healthy, um, going to the gym and exercising, doing the right things, they feel they should get credit for that in the research that we've done. And are there additional incentives we can put in? And my latest idea is to reach out to Nintendo because they've gotten more people moving in 48 hours than we've seen of eight years of Let's Go. So uh, maybe, maybe we could somehow new app. <laughs> maybe we could somehow connect it to Pokemon Go. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so we have a uh, question here about uh, uh, small businesses and and what can small business businesses um, offering small group policies do to contain health insurance costs besides self-insure. I could jump in just what health plans are doing already is certainly putting innovative benefit designs around to encourage people to get care when they need care, get it in the right setting. We've been designing patient-centered medical homes, accountable care organizations, there's a lot of different names, but to make sure that people are seeing the doctors and incentivizing the providers um, in the right way to provide the care that's needed, keeping people out of the hospitals, preventing things that shouldn't happen, taking their medications as needed to avoid further complications. So I think a lot in the delivery system reform that incentivizes, peop incentivizes people getting the right care in the right setting and better managing their costs um, and, and helping people get healthy and when they're sick, manage their conditions. We're learning a lot and the more we learn, we continue to innovate and I think that's um, really important to continue. Okay, great. So we're coming, uh, oh, we have a question. Um, just really, this was to address the, the kind of outreach towards um, millennial and healthier people. I think one of the things you mentioned is millennials are not necessarily keen for health care, but they're, they're more keen for healthier living. So one of the suggestions for insurers may be instead of tying healthier living to health care, tie health care to health, healthy living. And so if you approach it from that perspective, you may find that people are a lot more receptive, especially the millennial population, than you would think.
an excellent idea. <laughs> I do too. Sorry, I, I was taking it back from them. Um, great. We have um, a question about a, a proposed uh, premium increase. Uh, Wellmark Blue Cross Blue Shield announced an increase of 38 to 43 percent for 2017. Um, and indicated that at least 10 percentage points of the increase stems from the cost of a single extremely sick patient receiving um, really, really costly care. So this really gets to the high need, high cost individuals that um, we know are often driving um, a large proportion of healthcare spending. Um, and so um, maybe Justine or others, are there um, things that plans are doing to really target um, and address that high need, high cost population um, to, um, to, to get at both the ability to deliver better care for this population, but also to keep costs down. Sure. Um, I mean, one thing I would point out, and I know it's had some co controversy sometimes uh, uh, around town, is the reinsurance program was really designed to get just at that. Um, there are some plans that do have very high cost individuals. In fact, I know of a plan that has a, a member with hemophilia, they're getting the care they need, but there's a million dollars a month, $12 million a year, and you could see the kind of premium increases that has. And the reinsurance was designed to help lower premiums. I think the real focus is how do you make sure you've got the right balance? Those cases do exist because when the ACA went into place in 2014, the state high risk pools that cared for these people that could not get coverage went away. So you had many of these high cost people come in, but not enough of the balance of the people that don't utilize to make premiums affordable. And I think it gets back to the point of how do we make sure that we get everyone in, that they get the care they need so that they st stay healthy and we can manage their conditions. Mm -hmm. Because if only those that are coming in that have needs, it's gonna just keep costs going up. We need to find ways to bring everyone in. And that may require more innovative benefit design, as I mentioned, that appeal to those that might not have an ongoing health need, that wanna go to a retail center, um, that want healthy living to be part of their health care. So I think that's what we need to be looking at. I just wanna just ask, since we're on the issue of re reinsurance, um, and, and Corey had some, had some um, anal analysis in her, in her presentation about the effects on premiums this year of phasing out the reinsurance program. And then Justine has been talking about um, the need for ongoing reinsurance um, in this market. And I just wondered what the, um, what, if you can look at if there are other markets that have, that have reinsurance, um, like the Medicare Part D program, and is, it, is that a strategy, a policy option going forward, extending the reinsurance program for, for the marketplace, or, is it, or, is it, or won't it be needed after, after this year? So there are other markets that do have reinsurance mechanisms, so Medicare Part D, um, has a reinsurance mechanism, um, but the, the, the ACA reinsurance is kind of not your typical reinsurance. It's getting at, so um, last slide in front of me, but so for say in, in 2014, it paid I think 80% or originally was gonna pay 80% of uh, an, an individual spending between you know, 60,000 and $250,000. Um, so it's not gonna get that person who has $10 million worth of care because they've got um, some terrible um, condition or disease, it's not, that's not going to, to get at them. Typically reinsurance, that's when it does come in. It comes in to pay those very high costs. The reinsurance program under ACA was partly intended to say because those high risk pool people were going to be coming in, other high cost people were going to be coming in sooner than the healthy people into the ACA market, that this program could, could help offset premiums um, in the meantime while we were, the gradual um, enrollment of the healthy people came in, which is different. And they structured it that way, I think in part, um, because private reinsurance could also ar already be available to, to plans. Um, and since the reinsurance program was just gonna be temporary, they didn't wanna uh, displace that, that private reinsurance option if that public reinsurance option was just gonna go away. So I think it makes sense to think about whether a more traditional type of reinsurance program would, would make sense as the ACA moves on, as opposed to the, the, the particular kind of reinsurance it's, it had from 2014 to 2016. 
So uh, as we wrap up our session today, I'd like to ask each of our panelists to uh, tell us what we should be thinking about during the few months that we have before November 1st and the beginning of the open enrollment period. What should we really be paying attention to? A lot is going to happen between now and November 1st in terms of uh, premium, premiums and review and uh, insurance. Uh, there's just gonna be a lot happening. What should we really be paying attention to? And while we give the panelists just a moment to digest that and to think about how they're going to answer, I'd like to ask you in the audience to just pull out your little blue form in your folders and uh, get ready to fill that out. It's the evaluation form. And we can do a better job if you just take a minute to fill that out. So uh, let's start down here with Sarah, and what should we be paying attention to? I think um, in particular, um, w when we're, you're hearing um, about premium increases, premium, premium requests that are 65, 35%, um, it's really important to, to take the long view, particularly if you're, if you're helping people who are gonna be enrolling in the marketplaces this year and wanna understand what's going on. Um, last year, um, um, premium increases were projected to be, on average, um, as, as late as December, about 10% higher than they were in, in, 20, in 2015. Um, we even had some analysis, we had some fund, had some analysis that showed they were going to be 6% higher um, across the country. And in the end, um, what really matters is, what, is, what is the premiums for the plans that people actually buy. So the analysis that HHS um, did at the end of the open enrollment period found that premiums rose on average for people who have tax credits, which is the majority of people in the, in the exchanges, only on average of 4%. Um, so so it's really, what really matters is the plans that people buy in terms of what that actual um, increase, increase is. So I think it's really important to help people understand um, what they can expect um, in, when we're here, when there's so much noise about, about premium increases. Yeah, and I was gonna say something similar, that we, as I said in my presentation, we often just see averages, but we really need to dig deeper. As you're looking, as, as information comes out, don't just take the average and say, oh, that's what it is. I think there's a lot of things, there are a lot of things that underlie those changes, those averages, and there can be, as I said, tremendous variation across people, across states, across plans. And it's, so it's really important just not to take that average at face value, but really understand where it's coming from. I'm thinking the same thing. Um, <laughs> but, but on the, uh, uh, you know, back to the United example about leaving the marketplace, some plans are not gonna get the premium increases they want, and they're gonna leave the market. And, but there's gonna be a lot of other plans out there that are coming in and growing and emerging. And I think we just have to remember that you know, an isolated example of an issuer leaving the market is not the, 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 the end all and, and the ACA is a failure. Just be, just be cautious of that. Remember this, um, I don't know the exact number, but it's, it's well over 100 plans that are participating in, in the marketplaces nationwide. And I'd have to echo as well, ensuring that the plans get the premiums they need to cover the claims costs is incredibly important. Um, I echo everything that's been said. And then the other thing I would point out is those premiums and the products that will be available in open enrollment have been set based on the rules in place, and those rules can't change. We can't have what we've seen in some previous years where rules have changed and have impacted, whether it be risk quarters or, re, you know, that we've seen in the past or reinsurance. We need to make sure that the rules are in place, the premiums have been set on those, carry forward for the contract year. Okay, we have come to the end of our time, and I would like to thank our panelists for a very rich discussion. We do have a lot to think about, and I'd like to thank the Commonwealth Fund for their partnership in this briefing, and we'll see you next time. Thank you.